So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be uh, giving an overview of the research uh, from my recently completed PhD in Flinders University in Adelaide, uh, where I'm now an associate lecturer. Uh, the title of the presentation here is all about um, 3D digital libraries and their use in maritime archaeology. So um, a little bit of context, underwater survey is essentially we aim for the same standard as terrestrial archaeologists and we use a lot of the same techniques. Uh, these are some animations I've been making recently for our distance students to help them uh, get more practical knowledge. Uh, it's important still always to get um, a, a sense of the real site and to go to the site. Uh, but um, one of the problems we always face is that uh, manual techniques underwater, they're much, much slower than uh, terrestrial archaeology because of the environment that you're working in. And there's a case where one shipwreck um, had, I think, over 22,000 dives logged in, uh, on a site in Turkey. Uh, for an excavation that's been running for decades on. It's not, not even a particularly large shipwreck. So um, because of this, maritime archaeologists have always been really interested in techniques like photogrammetry. And this drawing here shows uh, one of the very first scientific maritime archaeological surveys uh, where they used a small submarine or a submersible uh, with a pair of stereo cameras on the front. Unfortunately, this uh, survey in 1967, this technique um, didn't really uh, pick up because it's still extremely manually demanding. It takes a lot of time to extract a few measurements from a survey like this. So for the most part, we've tended to use baselines and offsets and a lot of swimming back and forth. Uh, this all started to change just about a decade ago and I was um, very fortunate to be involved in some of the earliest work uh, back then, I was working on uh, the maritime archaeology diving contract for the Scottish government, and I was starting. I was wondering whether um, some of the photogrammetry software we'd been playing with on land could work underwater. We really didn't know, so myself and a colleague um, started testing it during a survey we were doing on a, a newly discovered 17th-century Dutch shipwreck, uh, a merchant ship that was found off the west coast of Scotland. And basically, we were amazed by the results of this, and it completely um, uh, changed our understanding of this shipwreck and helped us to date it and so on. And we could see that this was going to cause a revolution for maritime archaeology. And I actually presented some of these results at the uh, CAA conference in Paris in 2014. So uh, even at this early stage, uh, we realized that this was going to help us to do more than just survey and that we could now do new things that we couldn't previously do, like um, analysis, spatial analysis and reconstruction. Uh, even with this first site, uh, we were able to start using the data for virtual deconcretions of iron cannons uh, and for uh, reconstruction of this uh, anchor. So around that time, I published some papers on photogrammetry that eventually uh, led to me being offered a PhD at Flinders. Uh, so I moved to Adelaide in 2016. Uh, early on, I ran a workshop at the university uh, that eventually was published as an open access volume with Springer. And this is available for uh, free download. Uh, we tried in this volume to focus on research in maritime archaeology that was beyond survey and it went into the um, zones of 3D reconstruction and analysis and engagement and uh, all of those kind of um, more interesting areas. So this figure shows uh, from the first chapter, it shows how quickly that change in our discipline happened uh, almost overnight, you know, starting from about 2009. Uh, the number of references in, in papers in our main journal 
uh, went from less than 10% regularly since the 1970s overnight to pretty much half of all papers published uh, on an ongoing basis referencing 3D technology. And that's partly to do with photogrammetry, but it's also from related techniques uh, that have also emerged. Some of these are specific to maritime archaeology and some of our remote sensing techniques, sonar and so on, that can produce 3D um, data, but also, you know, more general technologies like 3D printing and virtual reality. Uh, and all of this is essentially converging on um, similar kind of pushing us into use of spatial techniques. So for my PhD, I decided to explore in detail how all these 3D technologies could be applied beyond a single, a single shipwreck survey into broader research questions. Um, building on that first survey of the Dutch 17th century, century shipwreck, I decided to focus on all of the merchant ships, the Dutch merchant ships of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, these ships were really incredibly important. They were the spaceships of their day. The Netherlands is a tiny country, uh, but these ships, uh, with these ships, they dominated global maritime trade throughout the 17th century uh, before being gradually overshadowed by the British in the 18th century. And during those two centuries, the Dutch sent out thousands of merchant ships all around the world, uh, and their shipwrecks can be found everywhere. Uh, the most famous of them are the Dutch East Indiamen shipwrecks. They're big three-masted ships with two decks, and they carried spices, uh, spices from the Indies back to Europe, uh, which was immensely profitable. And these are uh, especially significant for Australia because uh, a lot of the earliest European um, archaeology on this continent um, is over on the west coast and is Dutch East India ships that wreck there. Uh, most famously, the Batavia shipwreck. As well as ships like that, there's whalers, slave ships, cargo carriers. And these ships really have, uh, they acted like the engine of all this global exploration and cultural contact and conflict and wealth and colonization um, and so on. So despite all of that, um, it's strange that we really don't have a lot of information about what these ships looked like. Um, we know that the design had a huge impact on the um, rise and fall of Dutch hegemony in this period, uh, and we know something about the changes in those designs, but it's incredibly hard for a maritime archaeologist who finds a shipwreck to um, reconstruct it with any confidence in terms of its original appearance. So why is this? There's a couple of reasons. Firstly, the Dutch didn't build ships using a template like we would today. They built their ships um, more or less by eye and they added the frames at the end of the process. So this allowed a lot of variation in their design, a lot of hybrid designs. And this has really confused a lot of researchers or even at the time, you know, people uh, struggled to classify the ships, as you can see from these quotes. Uh, secondly, we're actually missing a lot of archaeological evidence. So even though there's been 50 Dutch East India shipwrecks found, uh, most of them have been found by treasure hunters who have destroyed the uh, remains without recording them in any way. Uh, and lastly, I think we're resp partly responsible ourselves as maritime archaeologists because we've put most of our efforts into studies of individual shipwrecks and spent years working on individual sites, producing big monographs um, and, and putting a lot of resources into the excavation. And that's all very dashing and romantic, but there's been very little work uh, to synthesize between shipwrecks, uh, with a few exceptions. So part of this is also um, compounded by the fact that uh, it's really hard to compare two broken up shipwrecks to each other in terms of their design, because, you know, if you're trying to do that based on black and white line drawings of the type that we've been making. Uh, and that's also very hard to compare those kind of records with contemporary sources, uh, drawings and scale models and iconographic evidence like paintings. 
So this is where um, 3D technologies can really come into their own, uh, not just by scanning lots of shipwrecks and, and you know, bringing them into the same space, but by finding other ways to combine them with um, other sources of data to build up 3D reference libraries that can bring the data together uh, and that can let us collaborate um, much more effectively. So I started my project by gathering a few scraps of archaeological scan data from anywhere I could. I was chasing up um, opportunities to get shipwreck scan data all around the world. I ended up diving on Dutch merchant shipwrecks um, off the west coast of Australia, back home in Ireland, uh, over in Scotland a couple of times, and even uh, in Vietnam at one point. Uh, but really all I was coming across was mostly anchors and cannon and very, I, I just couldn't get access to um, ship hulls and get scans of those. So that's uh, nice data, but it's not really useful for the um, concept that I wanted to develop. So luckily we have one big chunk of evidence in the hull of the Batavia wreck, which is an East Indian man of 1658, uh, which is, um, was excavated in the 1970s and is now in Fremantle on display. Uh, a lot of them have been miscategorized as well. So what I wanted to do for my study was build up a comprehensive list of them and try and go and scan as many of them as I could. Uh, so when I started doing that, it, I, it turned out that it's really difficult to scan a scale model of a ship. Uh, and the reason is because of the rigging. Uh, if you try and scan it, um, the rigging obscures a lot of the features that you actually want to capture, even if you don't care about the rigging, which I didn't. So I ended up testing all these techniques from structured light scanning to Faro laser arms and even CT scanners, which is what you see here. Uh, this is actually a great technique, but it's not really practical to get around to all the different museums in Europe uh, with, a, with a CT scanner. <clears throat> So eventually, I, um, after, after I didn't have much success at first, I came back to photogrammetry as the best solution. And this um, shows a time lapse of some of the capture in the museum. Uh, this is an 18th century slave ship model in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. I ended up scanning models in six museums across the Netherlands, and one in Norway, uh, two in the UK, one in Belgium, uh, and I even got a scan of one model from the US. Uh, this is a, a few pictures of the work in all the different museums. This was a huge amount of effort to move these fragile big models into position for scanning. And obviously I relied on a lot of support from different museum staff. Uh, which was all freely given for this project. Uh, in total, I ended up with a library of 60 um, scale models, and there was a huge amount of work in processing and editing all of this into the right um, format and into cleaning it all up and so on. But this is a really good core of data to start from in building a virtual reference library. Uh, this is an example of one of the scans, a very rare uh, 17th century model from Rotterdam. Uh, and these are some models from different museums in the Netherlands. One of them is actually from Norway. Um, we're able to reunite them with digital techniques and compare them. Uh, we also did lots of hydrostatic analysis and all these kind of things, uh, volumetric, um, capacity, scale, and so on. And this is another example of scale. 
So one of the things that was really fun was doing iconographic analysis and comparing um, models with paintings and so on. And this is a great example of a model where we have the real model uh, and the picture of the, the same ship built at the same time uh, that wrecked a few years later. So I was able to recreate that scene digitally. Uh, and eventually my uh, archeological case study, uh, one of the best ones turned out to be from Iceland, uh, where I traveled out um, in uh, 2019 and um, surveyed a shipwreck there. Uh, this is a Dutch flute shipwreck from 1659. So this is a nice view of the shipwreck site on the first night of our survey. Uh, we did a photogrammetric scan of the shipwreck underwater and positioned it in space. Uh, we did a lot of analysis of um, historical evidence and brought the model evidence in. Um, again, another model from the Rotterdam collection. And using all of this evidence, we were able to make spatially accurate um, 3D reconstructions of the wreck as it would have appeared. And this shows the wreck in its context and uh, the space that would have been available to the 15 survivors who had to cling on to the, the quarter deck here uh, over a couple of nights when this huge storm was happening that sank the ship. So um, I don't really have time to talk about the VR aspects of the project, but uh, I made two VR experiences as a way of disseminating some of this data and exploring that. Uh, the first one is this virtual dive on that Icelandic shipwreck uh, where you can actually try this out on YouTube if you want. Um, if you search my name in YouTube, you might find this. Uh, the shipwreck is called the Milkmaid. And the second thing which I'm working on at the moment is this uh, virtual uh, interactive museum where all the ship models, um, you can pick them up and, and look at them in high resolution. And then the fun thing you can do here as well is throw them in the water where they'll scale up to their the size of the ship they represent. And in fact, you can also go onto the deck of the ship uh, and walk around it. And there's a little museum style exhibit for each model where you can explore it in different scales. Uh, and you can see some of the historical evidence uh, and explanation of the symbology and so on. Uh, so this isn't available just yet, but I'm hoping to put this up on Steam quite soon as a free game. So uh, that's all. And I have to thank um, the people who gave me funding for this work, the uh, Flinders University. And for a lot of my field work, uh, the funding came from the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Canberra. So thank you very much.